Hello, everyone. Welcome to Natural Growing Through Biology Podcast. I'm Dennis. I'm Steve. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of inoculums. A little bit. It's yeah. an interesting topic. We were kind of we were on a flight here recently over at Acres and kind of chit chatting about when did this start? Because we we've you know back and forth. We've heard people say this. We've heard people say that. And it was just kind of a question of well, how far back does it go? And I didn't we know and. Actually, at Acres, it's funny because we've been doing this so long, we sometimes forget how some people see this as new technology. I know. You know? and Oh, so yeah, we, we had people stop by and, oh, you know, I've heard a little bit about Tinyo, and some people have been using Tinyo for years, and some people are, this is my first time at the show. Those people were just overwhelmed, the amount of information. But some it is. Some people, this idea of biological health, soil, microbiome, it's new. It's a strange world for them. Yeah. And so we thought, what a, what better than to kind of dive in a little bit to some of the history of actually how it got started. Yeah, we got in our Wayback Machine. We got in our Wayback Machine. Quiet, you. <laughs> so, I mean, it, let's go back to the bin- beginning. And, you know, we figured start with what most people are familiar with. Yeah, where, did, is, it, where did it start? What's the easiest one to look at? Yeah, and so everybody's familiar with rhizobia. Sure. Utilizing the rhizobia, and you know, you think about that, how long has that been around? Well, that was my question, Dennis, before, before I shared this, how long ago do you think rhizobia kind of got rolling and people started looking at it and utilizing it? What, what was, and you and were I'm thinking 53. like, yeah, 50s. Because that's when I, to me, that's kind of when it got started, and we'll yeah. talk a little bit that as we move on. But it really goes much further than that, doesn't it, Steve? It does. So looking back, back in the, the fairly early 1800s, 1830s, late 1830s, the idea of biological nitrogen fixation was discovered. They found organisms that were able to do that. And incredibly, the first patent in the U.S., 1896, Knob and Hiltner, patent for the first rhizobia, just unbelievable. And then by the 30s, it was common practice to yeah. be utilizing these. And, and kind of my memory of that, that's why I said 1953, was the first time liquid inoculants were really used. Yeah, you were back there, in, right? Yeah, I was yeah, there. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I helped do some of the research back then. What were those Funstone cars really like? I mean, did your feet get so, get, get tired and sore? Well, that's why my knees are bad. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, from sense. pedaling those cars back yeah, okay, in the day. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. But, you know, so clear back in 1953 was when they first kind of started using this. And in 1982, this was accepted in commercial yeah. agriculture yeah. as applications to overall help plant expression. That's the whole idea mm-hmm. behind using inoculation. At 1800s, it's just crazy. I mean, over 100 years. And the concept, we're coming up closer to 200 years for some of this idea of microbes lead to biological nitrogen fixation and that is just it, it's it boggles the mind the the science back then it was barely found i mean it's it's incredible looking back at some of the technologies that those guys were utilizing and the the leaps the understanding leaps they were able to create and and balance through and and generate through very simple methodologies i mean they had very simple microscopes and from that they were able to figure out well let's look at some of these organisms like let's look at some of these weird structures and then eventually they started being able to utilize some of the chemical approaches to be able to stain some of the stuff that's going on but it is just incredible that the the mid 1800s is when this kind of got going yeah and so you know then you cut we kind of go into the idea of mycorrhizae sure Again, when, when's that mycorrhizae has been around for I w- a while. I, my guess would have been like 80s maybe 90s yeah well actually clear back into the 50s I know you know the first strawberry mycorrhizae inoculation was done again back in 1953 about the same time yep. Rhizobia was starting yep. to be utilized mm-hmm. commercially. And if you think about that in the 50s, that's kind of when we had, I, I call it the, the fertilizer rev- revolution, yeah. when everything started chemistry. to change, mm-hmm. chemistry. Mm-hmm. And this information was known back then, but a lot of people didn't think about it because no. we had chemistry to help us. That was the direction everything was headed. That was the easy savior. That was humans stepping in, seeing how, wow, we need nitrogen? Yeah, I can work with those rhizobia, but whatever. I can just use the Haber-Bosch process and generate massive quantities of it and get it out there, buddy. That's easy. 
And so, you know, in 1957, mm -hmm. uh, again, was the proof of positive effects of mycorrhizae fungi yep. with the plant connection. Clear back, like I say, back in the 60s, they realized there was a There's plant benefit. benefit to not only mycorrhizae, or, but also rhizobia, mm -hmm. um, there's getting an understanding of how this can benefit in agriculture. It's just absolutely crazy. And again, we go back to the early 1800s when the idea of these mycorrhizal fungi, they weren't called mycorrhizal fungi back then, but these organisms that were attaching themselves to plants, and the first ones they saw were the ectos. They were easy to see. They see these pine roots, and they're completely coated and surrounded by something weird. And that's when they started seeing some of that, back in the early 1800s. Just unbelievable. And, and some of that technology goes based off the form when they started to identify the spores with yeah. the mycorrhizae fungi, which now made it usable yeah. in agriculture mm -hmm. situations. The, the idea originally was trying to basically take the living mycelia, living hyphae, from plant, from root, from soil, and transport it to a new plant, a new soil, a new field. And back when they were utilizing the living structure versus the spore structure, they had days, maybe weeks, to get these things transferred. So, you know, sometimes things didn't necessarily have the, the best name. So we start thinking about some of these processes and we start thinking about what's going on. And what's crazy is we seem to forget so much. I mean, sometimes we get kind of stuck in the past. And I, I have some silly pictures up here, this idea of snake oil. I mean, that's what a lot of people had thought some of these practices were, even though you go back before, like you were saying, the 50s, before that chemical revolution, it was becoming more of the standard. It was becoming better understood. So it's just, it's incredible that we have basically lost some of this information. And now we're getting back to going to um, all these different presentations, all these different shows, and hearing how people are talking about soil health, soil biology, how important they are. So the last 70 years of destruction, we're starting to get back to some of that understanding of, well, why don't we use life to help grow our plants in a living healthy way. Well, and when we start to talk, referred to as snake oil in the biological industry um, and stating that there's not enough information, that's mm. part of really what this is about is this is not a new concept, not no. a new idea that these practices were proven, mm -hmm. you know, 50, 100 years ago yep. and utilized. I mean, over 80 years, they've been utilizing rhizobia mm -hmm. and mycorrhizae fungi within that soil environment to get plant expression now just like any product when you start to talk about whether we talk about seed quality yeah and seeds that we're inoculating mm -hmm. our soil with or you start to talk about fertilizers mm -hmm. and fertilizer quality the same holds true of biologicals and yes. biological qual quality quality matters quality matters mm -hmm. and what you're using and the diversity of that product are very critical of a grower having an understanding or dealing with a company that has a very good understanding of how these guys function. Yes. Because that's very important. And I think that's some of where the snake oil kind of mentality comes from. Oh, definitely. Is because of, I, I guess, the biological or the regenerative agriculture movement right now. There, you know, when we've, you know, you go back 10 years ago mm -hmm. and there may have been, you know, 15 or 20 OMRI listed biological products. And they mm -hmm. weren't even inoculums, they were just biological products. Yeah. Um, and there's hundreds, literally five or 600 listed products today oh, that are just inoculums. And Not even like talking crazy. about mm -hmm. biostimulants yeah. or organic fertilizers or any of those types of mm -hmm. things. And, and the, the community, the, whenever there's money available, you're gonna have a flood. It's it's kind of a gold rush is what's yeah. going on. And that's where this idea of some of these snake oils, some of these bathtub brews, some of that stuff is going on. And unfortunately, it gives it a bad name. So we've talked a little bit about rhizobia and how they're scientifically proven. We've known they're functional. 1800s, first patent. The mycorrhizal fungi back in the early 50s and into the mid 50s, they started to find them, utilize them, and prove their effectiveness. And then we step into this next round, and that's this idea of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. 1978, Klepper coined the term plant 
growth promoting rhizobacteria. So that specific term, that specific idea has been around since the late 70s. And it was only a few years later, 1985, that Bruce Tinyo founded Tinyo, well back then it was Tinyo Technology and Technique um, Incorporated, now we're Tinyo Biologicals, which I think is a little better representation of what we're actually doing. But again, it's the same idea where the science is there. It has been there for oh, 50 years now. Well, and that in 1985 is when Bruce found Tinyo mm -hmm. Technology and Techniques. But before then, he already had an understanding. Back in the late 70s, mm -hmm. when this plant growth promoting rhizobacteria idea came around, his research was already headed down that yep. path of getting that understanding of these biological communities and how they function within Plant the health. soil Plant environment. Health. And how? really yep. what it comes down to is just like the rhizobia or the mycorrhizae fungi, you mm -hmm. can have your nitrogen fixing mm -hmm. bacteria, you can have your phosphate solubilizing bacteria. All of these are designed as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. And all of these functions are going on. And back then there wasn't the science. Bruce saw a benefit. And we look at a book like Dr. Huber's book, um, Trace Mineral and Plant Disease, tra Trace Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, those sorts of approaches where we see, wow, copper, it's critical for humans, it's critical for microorganisms, it's critical for plant, same with zinc, manganese, all these trace minerals are critical for cofactors of enzymes, creating that structure of the enzyme, or maybe reducing reactive oxygen species where we have to utilize you know, the iron, the copper, some of these trace minerals. And when we start going through that chemical fertilization process where NPK is what is utilized, we're missing all of that. And that's where we utilize some of these organisms and get that better transfer through rhizophagy of that nutrition from the soil to the plant. Well, and they're all critical also on a very key plant function is photosynthesis. Yes. We have to have those for the plant to actually function as designed. Yeah. And, you know, Bruce, it was funny because I used to talk to Bruce about different crops. And mm -hmm. he'd always ask me, you know, what do crops need? He said they all basically function off the same, same foundation. Yep, same yep. foundation. And one of the key points of that is photosynthesis. Yes. And oh. without these, the plant cannot function as designed. They're all making cookies, they're all generating that sugar, but then whether it's a chocolate chip or a raisin or whatever other type of cookie, that depends on the specific plant, but that base foundation is photosynthesis. That carbon fixation is what drives our world. We're, ba we're carbon based. Every organism that we know of on planet Earth and every living organism that we know of is carbon based. And that carbon fixation, the primary source of that is photosynthesis. It's taking that carbon from the atmosphere and building sugars, building those structures out of it. Yeah, and so a lot of times when we start to talk about this, they're designed to increase plant growth. Mm -hmm. That's what they're designed to do. And so if we start to think about that, we start to think about our crops within the soil, because in regenerative agriculture, that's what we talk about. Yeah. Living roots in that soil, cover crop for diversity, yep. all of these things are designed to build soil health. Yes. That's what we're talking about. Yes. And in order to do that, we have to have roots in the soil functioning as designed, basically building soil health. Because really, we're looking at it from the plant out. That's how we build soil health. Yeah, when, when we try to go out, and another way that I do see, you know, some problematic ideas occurring is just broadcast surface application. If I put a few microbes out there, I just go out there and spray them on the surface, bing, bang, boom, we're there, we're running, we're working. Well, that's not really how we perceive the best benefit. What we want to see is this we want to see these dreadlocks we want to see those roots completely surrounded by these organisms we want to create that rhizosheath where the mycorrhizal fungi are producing their glomalins and binding those larger macro aggregates together the beneficial bacteria are creating the micro aggregates where they're utilizing their extracellular polysaccharides to bind individual soil, individual sand, individual clay, individual organic matter particles together around that root. And around that rhizosheath is a zone that is, it's like our house, our house compared to outside of our house. It's much warmer, the environment is much better, it's a habitat. And you, Dennis, you talk a lot about building that habitat. Yeah, and but for right now, I mean, so often what we focus on is nutrient availability. Yes. And, you know, we talk about these 
organisms within that soil environment or the soil health, specifically around the idea of building nutrition mm -hmm. for the plant. Yep. And a lot of times, you know, I talk about basically what the microbes need, the soil needs, the plant needs, mm -hmm. and the human body needs. All of these things are, are tied together. And unless we're getting balanced nutrition, it goes back to like the human body, is we have to have good food in, over, in order to grow healthy mm -hmm. as designed. Okay. When we, kids, when, we, when you have a baby, we pay attention very closely to nutrition yes. because it is critical of how that um, young baby grows and expresses itself genetically. Are baby plants baby kind of plants. similar? But, you know, they might be. Does very it matter the same. how they they start growing? Do we see yield loss? Do we see decline? Well, and especially like you say, when we start to talk about annual crops versus perennial crops. Yeah. Perennial crops, it's for the lifetime of that plant mm -hmm. that we're building this yield. And for annual crops, we have a very short window. We, we go from basically a infant to a teenager to an adult all in a very short period of time. So our um, window? window of margin yeah. is, is very small. We mm -hmm. can't make a mistake or we start to lose that genetic potential yeah. of the plant. And those, and those key points of influence as are, a lot of people talk about, or critical points of influence. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, Bruce used to talk about this from the idea of basically soil microorganisms are the key link between mineral resources and plant nutrition. Yep. Bruce, Bruce said that back in 1989. When that was, was his first, understanding. Correct. When he was first getting started, as you said, he, did, he saw the benefits of the mm -hmm. plant, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, and he started seeing that based off of mineral resources, yes. nutrient availability. And the amazing thing, just getting back from Acres and seeing some of the new research that oh, Dr. White is so doing, cool. it's so exciting to, to find out that a lot of these things Bruce was talking about are now being proven mm -hmm. um, by a lot of this research that's being done by Dr. White and others within this um, uh, resource or this pool of we're starting to understand how this functions and actually what is exactly happening within that soil environment and also on the plant. And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but listening to Dr. White, he was basically saying that all plants are going to form relationships with organisms depending on what organisms are available to them as a seed, depending on what organisms are available in the soil. And a lot of that comes down to our management. If we are monocropping, heavy tillage, heavy chemical use, we're winnowing down the diversity of organisms that are available to plant. The plant's still gonna work with somebody, but is that somebody the best player? Is it a key player? Are we talking about some of these azosporillums that are great nitrogen fixers, great at producing phytohormones? And are we talking about some of the phosphate solubilizers that are great at solubilizing phosphorus? When those are available to the plant, it utilizes them and it clones them like we talked about. However, if we damage that digestive system in the soil, it's like when you take an antibiotic and you damage your own gut flora, there are downstream consequences. Your body no longer has access to some of those. So somebody's gonna flush in and fill that void. And are those good organisms or are they bad organisms? And that, that is kind of the question and that's what we start to see in some of these uh, soil environments that have been very heavily degraded. The organisms are always going to be present, whether or not they're good beneficial organisms, that's the hard part. That's what we don't know. You know, it's almost like we talk, start to talk about primary succession. Yeah. That where we start within mm -hmm. that soil environment. You know, we start with rock, basically. We do. And we start to see the lichens and, and that entire process. Well, before that, well, you have chemolithotrophs, or the organisms that are spitting out enzymes to break that rock down. They, and then we go, exactly. But it's a process. It is. And what we've done is as we build that process in, what I call the succession is we mm -hmm. get into that microbial fungal community within that mm -hmm. soil, bacteria to fungal community within that soil environment where most agriculture lives. Yeah. But based off our agricultural practices like Dr. White, we've moved backwards in back. primary succession. Yep. We are not where we need to be today. And that's where we have to start to think about is what have we done over the last 50 or 60 years when this information was there, but we did not utilize it because we went down another path. It was easier. It was easier. Mm -hmm. And back then it made sense. We had soil health 
at the time that we yeah. had incredible responses. But we've now degraded that to a point where we have to do something different. And that's what regenerative agriculture is you know, all about. And how we do that as a grower has a lot to do with our growing practices, yes. what crop we're doing, what things we can implement. But Bruce used to talk about the idea that plants, crops, animals, people are all dependent on a five favorable combinations of environmental mm -hmm. conditions. So we need light, we need heat, we need air, we need nutrient, and we need water. Yep. And with the exception of light, the soil can supply each of these factors, but only when they are supplied in the right combination is optimum health and growth obtained. Balance matters? Well, and you know, when we talk about this, how often do growers talk about, I have compaction? Yeah. You know, um, I don't have water penetration. Mm -hmm. I don't have the nutrient holding capability yep. that I need. All of these things basically come down to why we are doing this regenerative agriculture practices. So if we think about having, holding more water, mm -hmm. as we say, you know, 1% organic matter is over 27,000 yep. gallons of water, gives us better nutrient holding capable, gives mm -hmm. us pore space, mm -hmm. air. Mm -hmm. Gas exchange. In, that's not only important to the plant, but the key is it's important to that microbial community yes. within that soil environment because they need the exact same things. So when we start to actually talk about this, how's the best way to build air, nutrient, and water holding capability is that microbial carbon pump, that organic matter. It's it's building a house. I mean, just like it's, it's cold, it's winter. I don't want to be living outside right now. I want to have a nice, warm, cozy house. And the microbes are the same. They want to do the same thing. And they're utilizing what are known as extracellular polysaccharides. And that, like I mentioned, are creating the aggregates. That's what's creating the crumb texture. And I like to think about this, these roster roots, this rhizosheath. It's armor. It is a protective environment around the root that is full of a wide variety of again, depending on if they're available, beneficial organisms that are building that environment, building that soil, building that structure and that habitat that's allowing better moisture holding capacity, better gas exchange. And that also leads to better nutrient uptake. And that's really where we want this to end up. As we build this zone, as we build this structure, we allow the plant and the microbe to work together to build it. That's when we start to see true changes and this idea of from the root from the plant out from that source of carbon where those microbes are feeding and grazing and consuming and taking all that nutrition that's where it's building out changing the bulk soil is extremely difficult and it's not generally going to happen easily so we focus on that zone right around the plant right around the root and that's where we start, really start to build that soil health and that root health yeah, and so often I, you know, someone will make a comment to me or I hear this a lot. How does 50 grams per acre change that overall soil health of that microbial community? What are we doing to the native mm -hmm. or indigenous populations of these organisms within that soil environment? Bruce used to talk about that, and it, it really makes sense of what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an environment yes. for that plant to function as designed. We mm -hmm. talked about that. The, photosynthesis, get that plant actively sharing those sugars, those mm -hmm. carbons, that communication within that soil environment, that rhizophagy cycle of cloning those microbes within that root and spinning them back out based off a specific function. The beneficial be ones. Beneficial mm -hmm. ones, actually, or digesting the ones that it doesn't want, eating yep. them up and utilizing the nutrition that was in them, yep. spitting them back into that soil environment. And then that process continues to happen, but it's all designed based off of plant health. Yeah. And that's Bruce used to talk about. When I talk about habitat, I'm talking to create an environment for everybody to mm -hmm. be there. You know, we talk about the fungal community. Everybody wants to build their fungal community. The foundation of that is beneficial bacteria, yeah. but we also have to have the air, the water holding capability. We have to have all these things within that soil environment for it to function optimally, like mm -hmm. Bruce talked about. And we can't have all of these other organisms in there unless we create that environment. So really from the plant out is what we're talking about. Yeah. Let's focus on that location right where we can make the greatest difference based off of plant health mm -hmm. and create an environment for everybody to be there. Absolutely. And that's what we look at because we, 
have a very good understanding based off of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, mm -hmm. what their functions are, yeah. like rhizobia, like mycorrhizae. Mm -hmm. If we talk about phosphate solubilization, nitrogen fixation, potassium solubilization. That's what they do. Trace minerals. That's we what they do. We can focus on that for plant health. Yeah. And then let that soil environment dictate everybody else. Because there's, you know, if you think about it, it is a very small, this group of plant growth are very small set of function based off of overall soil health. There's a lot other organisms out there based off the bacteria and fungal community, yeah. but they all need that environment in order to grow. They do, and the, the, the better we build that environment, we, the faster we see those changes. Because if we wait on nature to do this, the, the, the Holocene, which in geological terms means the recent, is 10,000 years. How many farmers do you work with that can wait hundreds to thousands of years? Yeah. Not very many. So what do they do? And the concept is easy. If I'm trying to change my soil environment, I can wait for the seed bank that's present. And those seed banks can last decades to hundreds of years for those plants to pop up. And they'll slowly start to shift and change and the environment changes, allowing expression of different plants to start to grow that are gonna help with different nutrients. That takes a long time. So what do we do? We go out with cover crop seeds, specific mixes that are doing specific functions to change that and speed that up. We can do the exact same thing with purposeful applications of beneficial microbes, whether that's PGPR, whether that's plant growth enhancing fungi or mycorrhizal fungi. We can wait for nature to do it, but we don't have hundreds of years. Well, and the whole idea I talk with cover crops is going back to make sure that plant is photosynthesizing Maximum. and functioning yep. as designed. The best way to do that is ensure plant health. Mm -hmm. The best way to do that is through microbial inoculum or activity around that roof based off of function. So if we start to combine all of these practices, we can just get there quicker. Much and it, faster. You know, and I, I mean, I, I talk about this can happen in all soil environments. Mm -hmm. I've got a wheat grower basically in Connell mm -hmm. that last year had eight inches of rain and he has a root structure with those roster roots or that dreadlocks on those roots down significantly down deep into yeah. his soil environment. Mm -hmm. In March, we were seeing roots down over a foot yeah. into that soil yeah. environment covered in these dreadlocks. That's so cool. This is this microbial carbon mm -hmm. pump that we talk about. Yep. You want to build soil health? That's the quickest way to do it, is active roots in that entire, not a few stringy roots going down into that soil environment based off of what we're used to seeing, yep. especially in a drought year. Yep. I mean, these were covered. He was just amazed when he sent me that picture. And it's an indication that we are starting this process. The plant is working with the microbes, that soil synthesis, soil genesis, humification, all these processes are starting and moving forward to recreate or regenerate soil. So we thinking back, we talked about how long these scientific methodologies have proven the benefit of these organisms. 1800s is when the rhizobia and the mycorrhizal fungi were first identified and understood. And those rhizobia are considered a plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. They grow around the root. So the idea that these are, are strange and weird and don't really serve a purpose, we, re we need to get past that because it is an antiquated thinking methodology. It's, it doesn't fit anymore. We've got to get past that. We've got to get out of this idea that we can purposefully force feed the plant what we want to feed it, an NPK and salt-based fertility, and get it to perform the exact same way as we can when we start to utilize these microbes and these benefits from them through rhizophagy, including all those trace minerals. We've got to get to that stage where we're actually regenerating soil from the plant out. Yeah, and it comes down to if that tool is not in the toolbox for the plant to use, it cannot access it. Like Dr. White talks about, this communication, yep. these exudates that go into that soil profile, if they are asking for something specific, mm -hmm. but that function is not in that soil environment, the plant can't function as designed. And that's really what we're trying to put all the tools there and let the plant dictate who is most active at any given point, because this changes every second, every yep. minute, every hour of every day based off of plant need.
And with that, I think we'd like to say thank you again for joining us on the Natural Growing Through Biology podcast. We had fun. I had fun. Hope it's some great information that you can utilize. We thought we'd go down the path of the history of kind of where this all came about. Getting fired up. Happy growing. Thanks, everybody.